Hello, and welcome back to Kingdom Tales. I'm Father Lee, and together we're reading from The Tales of the Restoration by David and Karen Maines. Have you ever heard somebody use the word excellent and thought about what it meant? We use that word a lot. We, we might talk about a kind of a food as being excellent or the way that we do school as being excellent. But a lot of times we use that word without thinking about what we mean by it. See, sometimes we use the word excellent when what we mean is best. The trouble with using the word that way is that when we use it about our own behavior, let's say you want to be excellent at playing soccer. What that can mean is you want to be the best at playing soccer. And the trouble with using excellent that way is that what we mean is better than everyone else. But that doesn't have to be what we mean by excellent. Excellent can mean our best or my best. You know that St. Paul wrote the book of Romans. We read that often in church together. And at the very end of his book to the Romans, he said that God wants us to be excellent at goodness. Excellent at being good. He wants you and I to be excellent to do our very best to watch Jesus and then to do the things that we see Jesus doing. Our story today is about both kinds of excellence. Today's story is called Prima the Ballerina. Prima the Ballerina worked so hard at dancing, she even danced in her sleep. In the middle of the night, strange poundings would come for her bedroom and would waken her whole family. Thump, thump, thump. She's doing it again, her sleepy mother would say to her father and poke him with her elbow. Somebody stop the crazy girl, moaned her older brother groggily from across the hall. Ugh. The father growled as he crawled out of bed. Putting on his robe, he complained to his wife, you're the one who named her Prima and filled her head with all the nonsense about being the best. Sure enough, when he opened the door to Prima's bedroom, there she would be, dressed in her warm pajamas, poised on her bed, with the springs creaking and squeaking, exercising her classical ballet steps. Plié, tendu, frappé, écapé. All the time, she was facing her bedroom mirror, even though she was sound asleep. Thump, thump, thump. Prima's goal was to be the best ballerina in the city. She wanted to soar in higher jetés than any other dancer. She wanted to run round and round in amazing fouettes. She wanted to look more beautiful than all the others, to stun audiences with her grace. She wanted the spotlight. She wanted standing ovations. She wanted piles of flowers from admirers. She practiced hours every day and only left the dance studio when the dancing master turned off the lights and locked the door. She ignored her strained muscles and the bleeding blisters on her feet. Actually, Prima was not happy with the dance studio company. She felt that the others were not as dedicated to the dance as she, none of them worked as hard. None had a dancer's body. Few had the long, slender limbs or the high, arched instep of the classical dancer's foot or a light, strong leap. She was sure only a few had dancer's rhythm, and she was absolutely certain that none of the others practiced in their sleep. Except, perhaps, for Carney. Carney... A rich man's daughter was the only other natural dancer in the corps. She danced as though she never stopped hearing the music. She danced easily, making difficult steps look as though she never spent dedicated hours in the dancing studio. And she never acted as though she thought the other members of the dance company looked awkward and funny. She never tripped them when the dancing master wasn't looking or nudged them off balance. She never made snide comments about their appearance. That girl was too good to be true, and Prima did not like her one bit. Standing at the practice bar now, Prima could see Carney reflected in the wall of mirrors, 
laughing with a boy who had short legs and a very round stomach. Like this, Carney said to him, demonstrating the steps to a sequence. Then, like this. He tried to copy, and Prima snorted at him out loud. Carney and the rotund boy looked up and caught sight of themselves in the studio mirror. The boy giggled at himself, a round, jolly gurgle. See, I'll never be a dancer. Carney laughed with him, put her arm around his shoulders and said, But you can learn to love the dance. That's the main thing. Prima didn't like the way the two of them were having fun together. Then she caught a glimpse at her own face in the mirror. She was scowling. Quickly, she changed her expression. She opened her eyes larger. It was important to develop a habit of always looking lovely. She despised ballerinas who frowned and grimaced while working out. As a dedicated dancer, she spent a lot of time watching herself in these mirrors. Her mirror image showed her exactly how she did. If she kicked a leg above her head, so did her image. If she bent her knees, her image bent her knees. Prima thought to herself, Having a rich father doesn't mean that you will become the best ballerina, does it? It's a matter of hard work and talent. And if you give your time away to others, you won't have enough for yourself, will you? She noticed in the mirror that her smile was smug. With Carney in the studio, however, Prima practiced even harder. Rond de jambe, arabesque, attitude, develop, glissade, she vowed to be Prima, a soloist, a principal dancer. No, the principal dancer. She vowed to be Prima, to work her body into the fine ballerina's body. Stretch, extend, turn out, turn out. On point, up on your toes, thump, thump, thump. She worked so hard, she went through a pair of ballet slippers every week. Entendez, class, entendez. The door to the dancing studio banged open. Listen, class, listen. The dancing master came sweeping through, followed by a ragtag bunch of... Oh, no, thought Prima. More lost children. The dancing master was always dragging these ugly ragamuffins into the studio. Look what we have here, he shouted, as though it was the most delightful surprise in the world. We have new members for our dancing company. As Carney hurried to greet this scruffy crew, fury began to boil in Prima's soul. Now the dancing master would give these sloppy-footed missteps more time and her less. She never got the attention she deserved. The dancing master continued, Now, little ones, you are here to study the dance. But dance studio company is not like other companies. Here we help one another. Here is no stars. Here we learn to dance for king. Here is best dancing when we hold hands and learn steps together. But you understand all this? Every dance is part of the celebration for new day rising. Standing at the bar, Prima snorted again. She had never seen more unlikely dancers in her life. They had no poise, no presence. They shuffled their feet, their clothes were shoddy, their ungroomed hair fell into their eyes. Shoelaces flopped on the ground. She could see them tripping on slipper ribbons. She could see them bumping into each other in pas de deux and stumbling apart. How would they ever stand on stage and command the attention of the audience? So what, Prima, you have something to say? The dancing master had heard her snort. His eyes were stern. Before answering, she insolently bent to adjust her leg warmers, and then she stood straight, smoothed her gauzy tulle skirt down around her leotard. Placing her hands on her hips, she forced a smile. Yes, I do have something to say. How can anyone dance for the king when no one ever sees the king? Everyone made such a big deal over the fact that people of the city now live day lives, that the king had lifted the enchantment that once forced people to work and play only at night. But what did she care? She'd never seen the king if there really was a king. The only light that mattered to her was stage light. The dancing master spread his arms to the whole dancing class. 
is like wonderful game. The king is always with us. We cannot see. He's in disguise, but always he sees us. Would we learn to find him? So we dance for the king. In bright city, believing is seeing. The trim man flipped up his wrists like so. He bowed low, then executed a few quick steps and turns. The lost children clapped. He leaped into the air and twisted before his feet touched the ground. All oohed and odd, except Prima. She pouted. The master's leap was wonderful, particularly given the fact that he did it without any warm-up time. Any professional would recognize that, but the ballerina hated it when anyone else received attention. The dancing master smiled at his students. It's nothing, nothing. He waved away their approval with Sam. You see, here in dancing studios, the older helps the younger, the stronger helps the weak. The principal dancers help new dancers. We all learn to do best we can. We make beautiful dance for King. Under her breath, Prima mocked, It's nothing, it's nothing. Well, no one was going to make her partner with that fat boy and look ugly because of him. And she didn't care a whit about the king. To her, seeing was believing. Prima leaned toward the bar again. In the mirror, she watched Carney line the lost children against the far side of the studio. Quickly, joyfully, the other girl did a series of pirouettes, whirling like a top on her toes and tapping each child on the head as she passed. Like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. You, too, will learn to dance for the king. To Prima, the children in the mirror looked like cartoon clowns doing warm-up exercises. They'd make a terrible ballet corps for Swan Lake or the Nutcracker. The only choreography that would work for them was one for a new work that someone would have to create. Plump sausages and sticky hot cross buns. Prima chuckled to herself. The only way to become a success was to be concerned about yourself first. Look out for number one. Her image in the mirror lifted her ankle to the bar and bent forward, stretching out her spine and calf muscles. Then Prima the ballerina did the same. She was so pleased at her own clever humor that she didn't even notice this odd shift in the practice sequence. The days that followed were full of hard work. Prima was so determined to be number one that she began to sneak into the studio after everyone had gone home and the doors were locked. She had stolen a key from a hook in the master's office. She danced in her sleep anyway. She might as well dance in her sleep here. She was tired of her family's complaints. They never understood her desire to be the best. Turning on the music, she had the whole room to herself. She watched her image flitting gracefully across the mirrors with no one else to spoil her positions or crowd her space or interrupt her concentration as she made dazzling passes. But strangely, as the weeks passed, the harder she worked, the less satisfied she became. Her leg muscles were bunchy. They didn't like this. She didn't like the way that she looked. She felt fat. Her neck wasn't long enough. Maybe she should change the color of her hair. She noticed that Carney, though she spent precious practice hours helping the other children, seemed to grow more graceful, more lithe and carefree in her dancing. There was something joyous in the way she lifted her upper body, something elegant in the way she tossed her head, something breathtaking in the way she held a pose while leaping seconds longer than any leap seemed possible. She had something that could not be imitated by another, though Prima tried sneakily to copy her form. One night, after hours of frustrating private work, Prima's image in the mirror plopped down on the floor, ankles crossed, head in her hands. Prima followed. She just could not get it right. 
She felt like crying. In fact, she did cry. Suddenly, the door to the studio opened, and Carney stood there, holding her ballet bag in her hand. Prima? Prima, I was working late, but what? why are you crying? Can I help? So this was how her rival did it, the cheat she practiced overtime. Prima wiped her eyes. I wasn't crying. I just can't get it right. I'm so frustrated. It's always out of reach. I'll never be a prima ballerina. Carney put down her bag and sat on the floor beside her. Prima, you're a wonderful dancer. You work so hard, harder than anyone else in the whole company. And yet, well, perhaps you work too hard. I think I dance best when I've forgotten myself in the dance. In some way, we become a servant to the music. At that moment, unnoticed by either of the two dancers, the mirror image lifted its head. A yellow light of envy flashed in its eyes. Then Prima lifted her head. What, what do you mean? Carney smiled and handed the girl a tissue for tears. She said she had not been crying. Once upon a time, when I was a little girl, an evil man, a very evil man, came hunting for me. I was afraid he would catch me and keep me forever, so I ran away. And when I ran away, I became lost. And then a stranger, another man, but good and kind, came searching for me. He found me and took away all my fears. When I looked into his eyes, I saw that he loved me. Prima, it was the king. I have seen the king, and he's the most wonderful and beautiful of men. I'll never forget how terrible it is to be lost, and I promised myself that I would always help children who were lost and afraid. Most of the children will never be great dancers. We all know that but they're learning to lose their griefs and terrors in the movements. The music helps to heal them. It gives them somewhere to belong. They, all of them, can be joyful dancers in the great celebration. And you know what? Whenever I look into their eyes, I remember the gaze of the king, and I forget myself when I try to dance and try to make it beautiful for him. Carney paused. Prima had stopped listening. In fact, she had gone to sleep, or rather, behind the two, the mirror image, in a fit of disgust, had put her head down and covered her ears with her hands to keep from listening. The ballerina had followed her example. Sighing, Carney rose to her feet found an old robe in an empty locker and put it over the sleeping form. Then she wrote a note to the dancing master. I'm concerned about Prima. She chooses to be a one only, and I don't think she knows the danger. To the king, Carney. She turned out all the lights but one. In the middle of the night, Prima woke. She stretched and began to exercise at the bar. I've seen the king, she mimicked Carney to her mirror image. What a goody two-shoes. Prima, maybe you're working too hard. I know what she's up to. She's pretending that she doesn't want to be Prima Ballerina to put me off my guard. Well, I'm not stupid. The image in the mirror smiled. Prima smiled back. She turned three quarters to the mirror. Her legs were beautiful and shapely. Her neck was long and willowy. What could have been the matter with her to think herself ugly? Certainly, she was just suffering from dancer's fatigue. The image in the mirror performed a series of stretching exercises. Prima did the same. This was nicely executed. The image in the mirror bent deeply in plie. Prima bent deeply in plie, and yes, gracefully done. The mirror image began leaping into the air higher and higher, Prima followed. That was the highest she had ever leaped. Why, of course, if she just followed what the image did, she was brilliant. 
That was the secret for future success. She must give herself to following the image. The mirror self turned in glorious circles faster and faster. Prima did the same. One look told her that she had never danced so brilliantly or that her technique had never been so flawless. I will follow you, she thought. Whatever you do, I will do. I will go where you lead me. And not once did Prima think this to be odd. Shortly, Prima quit dancing studio company and joined the Imperialist Ballet Theater, which specialized in gala performances and was a company with many stars, and indeed she became a solo ballerina. When the orchestra played, Prima remembered her mirror image and danced out of the memory she saw in her mind. The spotlights dazzled her sight. When the audiences gave her standing ovations, she curtsied just as she had seen the image in the mirror do low and grandly like a queen. Yes. She was the queen of the dance. During bows, the flowers of her admirers were piled at her feet just as she had dreamed. But she had no friends to call her own. And her family never called or came to see her dance. So she slept in a room full of mirrors in order not to be alone. Her dressing room had a wall of mirrors. Her long, sleek limousine's windows were also mirrors, closing away all the glimpses of Bright City. She could never be or never wanted to be, far away from her own reflection. In time, even when she wanted to, even when her body needed to rest, she could not stop dancing. Her mirror image demanded the motion, and though she danced beautifully, she never danced joyfully. But Carney. Carney and the found children danced in the streets. They laughed when they bumped into each other or tripped on their shoelaces. And because they had all kinds of bodies, fat ones and short ones and skinny ones and roly-poly ones, the old people who wanted to learn to dance were not afraid to try. And because no one was a principal dancer, but all were part of the troupe, even self-conscious, middle-aged ladies and men who had never learned to dance caught the infectious wonder of the steps and forgot to think about how funny they looked. Much to the delight of the dancing master, dancing studio companies were started all over the city. Here, many people learned how to hold hands and how to help one another in the steps. Here, people learned to love the rhythms of the new celebration. Here, they were taught the dance of New Day Rising. And whenever they looked laughingly into each other's eyes, they saw, sometimes without knowing that they saw, the loving look of their most beautiful king. For he is a king, after all, who takes joy when the people of his kingdom learn all the steps. <laughs>